Welcome to part three of natural deduction. This video provides um, information on how to translate proofs from natural languages into symbolic form, and then to use the rules of natural deduction, in this case, the eight of the implication rules, to prove the conclusion. So we'll start off with the sample problem. Um, this is from the textbook Logic by Stan Baronet, the fourth edition. So it's a kind of artificial example in that it's made a bit easier to interpret. The premises are given first, the conclusion last, and we're also given a set of capital letters that we're supposed to use in the order given to represent the simple propositions that occur in the argument. So this format helps us to get a sense of what's going on. When we encounter arguments in ordinary language environments, it may be a bit messier, a bit trickier, but this is a good way of allowing us to build our skills gradually. So the first thing we can do is try to find the main conclusion of this argument. If I bet red on roulette, then I will win my bet. If I win my bet, then I will stop betting. If I'm feeling lucky, then I bet red on roulette. I am feeling lucky. It follows that I will stop betting. So what is the conclusion of this argument? So the phrase, it follows that, is a conclusion indicator. So the proposition that follows, it follows that, is the conclusion. I did say that on these problems, the conclusion is always gonna be placed last. So that is um, a kind of convenient tip. However, it's good to get in the habit of identifying conclusion indicators to help orient you in the argument. Now let's look for the um, logical operator terms that we can use to translate with logical operators like the wedge, the tilde, the horseshoe, or the triple bar. So I put these in red. We can see if then, if then, if then. There don't seem to be any other operator words. Um, when we see the operator if, uh, we can either circle or highlight both if and then, or just if, because we're only gonna use one operator to translate both. It can be helpful to highlight or circle both the words if and then because that helps us identify the different parts of the conditional. Whatever follows if is going to be the antecedent. Whatever follows then is going to be the consequent. So you might be thinking that the word stop expresses a negation, but um, you don't always have to pull out negations from verbs. It really depends on the context. So the word stop is not the negation of start, for one thing. It is the negation of continue. So if you stop something, you're not continuing it. But I would only use the tilde to translate stop if it does occur in an argumentative context where it's being contrasted with continuing something. And keep in mind that there's a fair chance that you would have an argument that would talk about stopping versus not stopping, in which case you wouldn't need a negation with stop, you would need a negation with not stopping. So unless it's necessary to express the logical structure of the argument, you don't need a tilde to translate the word stop, but we'll come back to that later. So after we've identified the logical operators of the argument, it's ready, it's time to look at the simple propositions. We do have the letters given for us conveniently, R, W, S, L. So where is the first simple proposition of this argument? It's in the first sentence, I bet red on roulette. Now I'm using green to represent this proposition even though it contains the word red. It's just to be consistent because in these videos, we're always using red to indicate the operators. But in this case, it just creates a bit of an awkward. We're using green to represent the simple proposition R. And R stands for, I bet red on roulette. So what is the next simple proposition in this argument? It's, I will win my bet. Um, and you'll notice that we're highlighting these simple propositions wherever they occur in the argument. So the first one, I bet red, occurs twice, and so does the second simple proposition, I will win my bet, that also occurs twice. The third simple proposition is, I will stop betting, and that also occurs twice in the argument. And we have one last simple proposition, I'm feeling lucky that we're symbolizing by the capital letter L. 
So we basically highlighted the operator terms, if then, and all of these simple propositions. We have our conclusion indicator. So now it's time to really start putting this into symbolic form. So we're gonna have to get rid of our picture of the roulette wheel, so give us some room. The first line of the argument is going to be R horseshoe W. The if then operator is translated by the horseshoe. The antecedent is I bet red on roulette. It's translated by the R and it comes before the horseshoe because it's the antecedent. And the consequent is W, I will win my bet. So now let's go on to the second line of the argument. If I win my bet, then I will stop betting. So this is also another conditional. It just has a different antecedent and different consequent. The third line is if I'm feeling lucky, then I bet red. And that's also gonna be another horseshoe. The fourth line, I'm feeling lucky, is a simple proposition. There's no operator, so we can use just the capital letter L. And now we have the conclusion indicator phrase. It follows that, so we know the conclusion is going to be placed after a slash on the last line of the premises. The conclusion is also a simple proposition. I will stop betting, so we can just symbolize that by the S. So we're done with the translation part of this exercise. We have the premises and the conclusion after a slash, but now the second part begins. We're gonna treat this as a proof that we have to demonstrate line by line how to derive the conclusion from those premises. So you'll notice the conclusion S, it appears in line two as the consequent of the conditional. But how can we derive S by itself on its own line? That's what we're strategizing how we can do. So if we look at lines three and four, they fit the form of modus ponens. So we can use modus ponens on lines three and four to derive R. And maybe you can already see where this is going, but if you ever get stuck when you're working on a proof by natural deduction, one way of getting unstuck is just to apply a rule that fits some of your premises and see if that conclusion helps you get closer to the main conclusion of your proof. So now that we have R, what can we do next to help get closer to proving S? There's more than one way of solving this proof. The other way uses only modus ponens, but we can also use hypothetical syllogism with lines one and two. You'll see those are both conditionals. The consequent of line one matches the antecedent of line two. So we can use hypothetical syllogism with those two premises to create R horseshoe S. And perhaps now you will see how we can derive our main conclusion. We use modus ponens on lines five and six to derive the consequent S. And we can stop there because it matches the main conclusion of our argument. Now let's look at another sample problem involving translation and proof. If Maria is a comedian, then she is shy. Either Maria is a comedian or if she is not shy, then she is famous. Moreover, Maria is not shy. Consequently, she is famous. So as before, we're gonna begin by identifying the main conclusion of this argument. We're gonna put the conclusion indicator word consequently in bold. The proposition that follows that will be the main conclusion of the argument. Now let's identify the logical operator terms in the argument. We see in the first sentence, if and then, so that's gonna be a conditional. In the second sentence, we have an either or, that's gonna be a disjunction. And after the or is another, a couple of operators, an if then, which is gonna be a conditional, and also a not. So notice if she is not shy, that not is going to negate the antecedent of that conditional. And you'll notice there's one final operator in sentence three, not. So it's gonna be another negation there. So our next step is to identify the simple propositions of the argument. The first simple proposition is Maria is a comedian, which we're supposed to symbolize using the letter C. And that occurs twice in the argument. The second simple proposition is Maria is shy or she is shy, um, which we're gonna symbolize by the capital letter S. You'll notice the wording varies slightly. She is shy versus Maria is shy. But because they have the equivalent meaning, we're gonna translate them using the same capital letter. Now these arguments, uh, these uh, ordinary language arguments are written pretty consistently, so it's easy to identify where the same proposition recurs in the argument. In ordinary language contexts, you're gonna find a lot of variation in how a proposition is expressed. 
So you need to be able to get used to looking at the underlying meaning of a statement to see if it really expresses the same proposition, the same logical idea or not. So now we're going to look for the third simple proposition in the argument, and that is she is famous, and that occurs twice as well. We've identified our simple propositions, C, S, and F. We've identified our logical operators. We know the main conclusion. So now it's time to translate this into symbolic form. Well, notice the first sentence is a conditional if then. So we're just going to have one horseshoe. C, Marie is a comedian is the antecedent because it comes after if. S, she is shy is the consequent because it comes after then. The second premise is going to be a disjunction. You'll notice we have the word either first. That's an indicator that the wedge is the main operator of this premise. Oftentimes, the, if you have more than one logical operator word in a sentence, the word which comes first is going to uh, indicate the main operator for the entire proposition. So if the horseshoe had been the main operator, the word if would have occurred first in this sentence. It would have been something like, if either Marie is a comedian or she is not shy, then she is famous. So in this case, because we have the either first, it's an indicator that the wedge is actually the main operator. And so either and or serve as bookends for the first disjunct. So Maria is a comedian is the first disjunct. And then whatever follows the or is going to be the second disjunct. In this case, case we have the phrase or if. That indicates that the second disjunct is going to itself be a conditional and if then statement. So um, we also have not. The placement of the not is important. In this case, because it's before shy, it only negates the, the antecedent of that conditional. It does not negate the entire disjunct. Now, if that not were supposed to indicate, uh, supposed to negate the entire second disjunct, the not would have been placed before the if. The not is going to negate whatever it comes before. So the wording would be something like either Marie is a comedian or it's not the case that if she is shy, then she is famous. But in this case, the not only comes before shy, so it only negates that antecedent. We do have to introduce a set of parentheses to indicate that the wedge is the main operator not the conditional. The third premise is going to be the negation. Maria is not shy, so that's going to be tilde s. And then we have to write in the conclusion, consequently she is famous. That's going to be just the simple proposition f, which we put after the slash to indicate it is the conclusion of the argument. So now we've completed the translation, but we have to begin the proof. You'll notice the main conclusion is f. You can see f located in the um, second premise in the consequent of the conditional that is the second disjunct. So you can start strategizing how can we isolate F from that much longer expression. We have to figure out what implication rules we can use to get F by itself on its own line. So you'll notice lines one and three already fit the form of modus tollens. So we we're using modus tollens on lines one and three. And perhaps you can already see how this will get us closer to the conclusion F. But as before, even if you weren't sure exactly how you'd be able to use tilde C at first, it's not bad to try modus tollens on lines one and three to see if you can use tilde C in a useful way. So you'll notice modus tollens fits the form of lines one and three because line one is a conditional and line three is the negation of the consequent of that conditional. So modus tollens allows us to derive the negation of the antecedent, in this case, tilde C. Well, we can use tilde C uh, with line two, which is a disjunction. The first disjunct of line two is C. So that means we can use disjunctive syllogism with lines two and four to derive the second disjunct, tilde S, horseshoe F. So we're still not at our main conclusion, but notice we're getting closer to having F by itself on a line. So now what's the last rule we can use to derive F alone by itself? The answer is modus ponens, which we can use with lines three and five. Modus ponens allows us to go from a conditional and the antecedent of that conditional to proving the consequent of the conditional must be true. In this case, the conditional is tilde S horseshoe F. The antecedent is tilde S, which we see on line three. So we can use lines three and five together to prove F. And now, 
because that matches the main conclusion we were supposed to have, we are finished with this proof.